And I'll start with talking about the issue of accessibility. So I know that you, most of you all know this, that you know there are still many, many people in the world without uh, access to electricity. Uh, estimates are around 1 billion people out of our 7.5 billion people on the planet who don't have access. And if we look at places like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, basically there's been really almost no improvement over, uh, over a 20 year period that population is growing faster than, uh, than electricity access is. In some parts of the world like India and, um, uh, and uh, Bangladesh, there has been a significant improvement in the availability of electricity, at least at the village level. But in those cases, just because it's available at the village doesn't even really mean it's available to individuals. It just means if you could afford it and if you have the proper hookup, you can have access. So lots of people, and, and it um, you know, just goes without saying that it's pretty unimaginable for us sitting where we sit, uh, living without access to electricity. And I think the situation is even more daunting when you look at cooking fuels. Uh, there are about 2.8 billion people or about more than a third of all people use solid fuels for cooking. So this is biomass, cold charcoal, also used for heating. Um, and there's really been no improvement whatsoever uh, over the past 20 years. Uh, this has been really hard to displace for a whole set of very complicated regions. And challenges are, of course, the air quality uh, implications of burning solid fuels, particularly burning them in, in households. Uh, but it's also very time consuming to go get the solid fuels and, uh, and collect them and have them available when you need them. So, so a real challenge in the area of cooking and warmth. So what I'd like to spend a moment doing is just talking about the benefits of, of energy consumption. And I'd like to talk about this in the context of sort of the average uh, uh, amount of energy consumed by a person for per year, okay? And we can look around the world at different countries and they all have a different average um, uh, availability of energy. And, and this sort of characterizes what one could expect in terms of the energy services av available at different uh, levels of consumption. So if we look at uh, countries where people are in the range of, or portions of countries where people are in the range of 20 gigajoules per person per year, um, you've got basic cooking, uh, some warmth, water availability, household lighting, and maybe you know, a cell phone. But that's sort of this very basic package of energy services. If you can move up to say double that, what we start to see is people begin to use irrigation. There's the potential for things like food preservation, cooling, cooking, uh, you know, and sort of industrial scale cooking. Uh, transportation, you know, you get, you can move beyond a purely subsistence kind of agricultural and start generating markets. If we get up to say 60 gigajoules per person, we start seeing really enhanced communications, entertainments, TVs, school lighting, computer access, basic health care, much more widespread transport, sanitation, and so forth. Once we get up to 80 gigajoules per person, we can start supporting industrial and commercial development, so machinery, automation, industrial processing, and so forth. And once we get up to 100 gigajoules per person, the energy services are really advancing quality of life. So we start get to comfort heating and cooling, advanced healthcare, advanced technological development, and so forth. So there's this hierarchy, but the, the availability of energy is very important in the context of, you know, is it available on demand? You know, so if you're up at the 100 gigajoules per person, you could expect when you flip the switch, it comes on. Um, but at the very low levels, you know, the energy services are very sporadic and, uh, and, uh, and unreliable. And there's a similar issue with regard to uh, energy quality. Uh, you cannot run advanced uh, equipment and machinery unless you have a, a grid that uh, provides very high quality power, meaning it's, it stays on, but also with good frequency regulation and so forth. So, so this brings us then to, to this chart where we can see the correlation between uh, availability of energy and, and at least one measure of human well-being. 
So this is in this graph, we've got the energy per capita on the x-axis and on the y-axis, we have the human development index, which is a composite indicator of human health, level of education, as well as uh, uh, gross national income per capita. And the higher this value, the, uh, the, the more well-being uh, is, is uh, reflected by this number. And what you can see here is that countries at less than 100 uh, gigajoules per person uh, typically have very low human development indexes. You can see it goes up. And by the time you get to 100 gigajoules per capita, uh, very interestingly, what we see is there's, there's almost no benefit uh, in terms of this index of well-being. And so if you look at uh, countries like the United States, they're way over here at nearly 300 gigajoules per capita. But if you look at uh, countries like India, uh, much closer to about 0.6. Uh, China has been adv advancing steadily and uh, it's now uh, close to 100 gigajoules per person and close to uh, 0.8 human development index. So, so in light of this and in light of the fact that um, you know, we need to provide equitable, uh, affordable energy to everyone. The question is, well, how much, what might we need? And, and from my perspective, that if we set a global target of about 100 gigajoules per capita, that would put us in the right ballpark of how much energy we need to provide. Um, I used to say, imagine a world like where everyone lived like an Italian, which is the Italians are a little bit more than 100 gigajoules per capita. And, uh, and everyone goes, yeah, I can imagine that sounds like a pretty good life. So, uh, so as a target, uh, that's, uh, I think, a good start. So when we think about energy access, though, this is not a static situation. As we know, the world's population is growing. Uh, incredibly quickly. It's always a shock to me to see every time I turn around, there's another half a billion people. Uh, today, we're at about 7.6 billion people. And if we look at the United Nations forecasts out to around 2,100, 2100 uh, we're in the, in the ballpark of about 11 billion people. And it's also interesting to, to take a look at these uh, projections of increased population in terms of where will population be growing. So if we look at upper income countries, what we anticipate is, is that the growth rate, um, you know, basically we are, in, are not increasing populations in upper income countries. Uh, in middle income countries, interestingly, populations are um, uh, anticipated to go down but we see enormous growth in the population of the least developed countries, which further exacerbates this energy access challenge because we're gonna have more people in the places where people already need more energy the most. So, uh, so we can uh, say we need 100 gigajoules per person. We've got 11 billion people, we'll have 11 billion people uh, estimated by 2100. So we need to, Imagine designing an energy system of about uh, 1,100 exajoules. Uh, that's a big number to put into context. That's about two times today's global energy use. So from my perspective, as we you know, grapple with the climate and energy challenge, I've always got this number in mind is what collection of energy resources and technologies can, uh, can provide 1,100 exajoules. But of course, the story doesn't end here, there. We've talked about uh, the challenge of accessibility, but there's also the challenge of having an energy system that's protective of the environment. And of course, there are you know, very significant air quality issues, but that's really not the focus of today's conversation. Uh, here, we are really talking about climate change and how do we design an energy system that's both accessible and helps us solve the climate problem. So, uh, so we can take another look back at the energy system. And as I said, we had about 600 exajoules of primary energy. Uh, about 82% of that is from fossil fuels. Of course, the challenge is that when we combust fossil fuels, we make carbon dioxide, which leads to the accumulation of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere and, and global warming. 
And here's a record from uh, August 21st, just uh, 10 days ago, of the latest uh, data from uh, the Mauna Loa Observatory with carbon dioxide concentrations uh, you know, in the range of 415 uh, parts per million. Uh, and, and again, this is you know, daunting to me because when I started really paying attention to this issue, the CO2 concentrations were about 360 parts per million. So it's not a surprise that there's been significant warming uh, over the past, uh, past um, 200 years or so. So this is a, a data set uh, made available by NASA, uh, looking at the global average temperature. And uh, we can see you know, steady warming uh, to today, where, as I mentioned, about 1.5 degrees C of warming. And we already see very significant consequences of this. Uh, here are two really striking uh, photographs from space, uh, one of California in 2018 and one of Australia in 2019. Uh, both, of these, uh, both of these regions with massive wildfires, unprecedented wildfires. And you know, having lived in California since the 1960s, we've always had wild, wildfires, but uh, they didn't start in June, they didn't last till November, and they didn't do the massive amount of devastation that we see with today's fires. And, and likewise in Australia, this was really unprecedented. And, uh, and, and here is a, some photographs just from uh, a week ago. Again, California on fire as we we're having this meeting, uh, very significant fires, particularly in Northern California, uh, very close to where I am. And uh, on the right hand side, again, an amazing photo. Uh, this was from the International Space Station. Uh, looking at the cloud of smoke uh, over California. So everyone has their own version of experiencing climate change. It depends on where you live. Uh, it's highly local. Um, but I think almost everyone now has some experience in their own life that, uh, that uh, an accumulation of experiences really, which say climate change is here today. Of course, there are in addition to, to these uh, immediate and, uh, and extreme events, there's also sort of slow moving catastrophes is the way I would think about them. Um, if the Greenland ice sheet melts, uh, we'd anticipate about six meters of sea level rise. Um, this will be an enormous problem for, uh, for coastal cities. And this, uh, I took this photo myself uh, and I was next to a glacier that was calving at a rate of uh, four times, you know, now calves at a rate of four times the, uh, the, uh, the average uh, in, uh, from the 1960s or so. Um, and this is the largest glacier in, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. So that brings us to, well, what are we gonna do about it? Well, the IPCC uh, in, in the, the fifth assessment report and, and uh, more recently in the 1.5 degree C report um, have made it clear that we have a carbon budget. Um, and the idea is that if we want to limit warming to, for example, two degrees C, uh, there's going to be some maximum amount of carbon dioxide that we can emit. Um, and, uh, and if we want to, for example, uh, have a 66% probability that warming will remain within two degrees C, we have a remaining budget, because we've already spent a lot of our budget, of about 1,100 uh, gigatons of CO2. And I think the, the equally important uh, conclusion from, from uh, this perspective is that if we go over our budget, we're going to continue to have warming. So if we really want to stabilize climate at one and a half degree or two degrees or wherever, at some point we have to achieve carbon neutrality, which is where carbon dioxide removal, which is the focus of this work, becomes so important. And this is set on a backdrop of the fact that there are many CO2 emissions that are very difficult to eliminate with today's technologies, either from an affordability point of view, or we simply just don't have another option. Uh, these are things like shipping, aviation, long distance road transport, iron and steel uh, manufacturing, cement, um, and, and also 
even though renewables have gotten to be in many parts of the world the lowest cost option for providing electricity, uh, there are still very significant challenges associated with integrating renewable generation to provide um, the reliability and the quantity and quality of electricity that we need. So that uh, at least for the time being, um, having some kind of particular natural gas generation available uh, to provide what we call load following electricity is going to be important. So if you add up all of these uh, difficult to eliminate emissions, we're about 9.2 uh, billion tons a year. Uh, and, and this was based on 2014 data, quite similar today. And by 2100, who knows what that number will be, but it will be uh, you know, significant, most likely. And uh, if we're going to deal with these emissions, we need some form of carbon management. It could be uh, capture and storage on point sources, or alternatively, we can um, look to um, other solutions that directly capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, this is put into uh, sharper focus by uh, integrated assessment studies, which show that if we want to achieve uh, limiting warming to, to two degrees C or less, then we're going to be, need to be on trajectories, such as shown by the, the blue uh, and green curves here, uh, suggesting that we need to be very close to peak emissions. We need to rapidly uh, decrease emissions and that sometime uh, in the latter half of this century, we're actually going to need to be actively removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which brings us to the urgency of beginning to develop the technologies and approaches that allowed us, us to do this and at a really enormous scale. I mean, if you look at these numbers there, like 15, 10 to 15 gigatons a year, uh, you know, that's on the scale of a third of the global energy system today, and we know what an enormous that endeavor is. So there are many, um, many pathways to uh, carbon dioxide management and carbon dioxide removal. Uh, this was a chart that was prepared in 2016 at the request of the Secretary of Energy to, to try to lay out the broad landscape of what are the options for carbon dioxide uh, removal. And we won't go through this in any detail, but it does set the stage really for, for the agenda items that, that we're thinking about today. Uh, we have a source of our emissions, you know, today about 36 billion tons. We can choose to capture from concentrated sources or we can uh, capture from the air. There are a whole set of capture and conversion processes that are possible. Uh, the, the result of that capture process that could be either you have a gaseous, uh, a gaseous uh, CO2, you could have organic carbon, you can have inorganic carbon. Uh, and then once you have those, then there's of course the question of, well, what, what is the ultimate fate of that? And you can either choose to utilize uh, that carbon uh, or you can sequester it. And uh, you could sequester it in geological formations, grasslands, forests, wetlands, oceans. So today's conversation is really going to be to explore uh, the right-hand side of this chart, looking at the potential of, of nature-based climate, climate solutions to help us uh, address this challenge. So just to wrap up, uh, the dual challenge we face of energy access and climate change we need twice the amount of energy that we're using today, and we need to do it in a way that's carbon neutral. And with that, I am done, and thank you very much. And I will stop sharing my screen. Great, I'd like, I would like to remind everyone to please use the Q&A function to submit some questions. I know that we've got a couple queued up, so I'll hand it over to Jennifer Milne. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, wonderful presentation, Sally. Uh, so we have a couple of questions. Um, I'd like to start with uh, Shafiq Jaffer. Uh, Shafiq, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Sure, Sally, I had a bunch of questions for your presentation. I'll ask my last one first, perhaps, uh, since you were covering that. The 10 to 15 gigatons per year for uh, kind of negative emission technologies to even reach the 2C scenarios is uh, quite daunting. Does the general community really believe there are sufficient routes currently that we understand from either direct air capture, 
natural climate solutions, et cetera, really, really to get there? Are we believing this is really kind of a route today or is it still very much pie in the sky? What's your take on it? Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's a, a, a question of money. Um, I mean, we know we can capture CO2 directly from the air today. Um, you know, it's quite expensive. Uh, but if we were to capture CO2 directly from the air and sequester it underground, you know, global estimates are anywhere that oh, 3,000 billion tons to 10,000 even greater billion tons of CO2 storage capacity. Um, you know, in saline formation. So, so as a backstop technology, um, could we do this at, at uh, 10 to 15 uh, uh, billion tons a year? I think so. Um, now, if you're looking at, uh, at others, you know, more nature-based solutions, you know, I think then there are lots of questions and there are people who are more expert than I are, um, you know, what are going to be the consequences of the massive uh, land use changes that would be required, for example, in the, uh, in the area of terrestrial uh, solutions, or if you look at oceans, you know, what would be the consequence of, of, um, of um, you know, ocean fertilization or direct injection, you know, at, at that scale, well, or alkalinity modification. So I think in the nature-based solutions, there are many questions about, you know, is, is, the, is the cure going to be worse than the disease? Um, but I think that if it were purely a technological play, could we, you know, capture it from here and put it underground? I think we could do it. But it would come at a very significant cost. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chef Shafiq, for the question. And it looks like um, folks are taking a little while to wake up this morning. So Shafiq, if you want to go ahead and ask another one of your questions, because you have, I know you have uh, many, so. So, so Sally, the, the other question I had was when we look at this um, 100 gigajoules per person, I think you kind of answered it uh, with the current energy mix, this translates into CO2 emissions, if I see that correctly, probably about double where we are today? Right. Is if we have right? the exact same energy mix, yeah. Okay, so that was kind of the number you put at the end there of the doubling of the energy. And, and from a standpoint of decoupling cooking versus heating for biomass and solid, you mentioned for the last 20, 30 years, we've really not been able to make a dent on this use uh, in the developing economies primarily. How do you see that? Is that something we can really decouple and kind of address the needs from a heating versus cooking in different ways? Or is this really kind of a coupled problem that we can't address? Yeah, you know, it's probably not a, a couple problem. I think for very, very low income people, I think it's a couple problem. I think for, um, and, and particularly rural, very low income people for, um, for urban or you know peri-urban uh, populations, I think that they probably can be decoupled to a, a certain extent. Uh, you know, we still though see a massive amount of use of biomass in uh, you know major you know cities of 10 million people. You still using um, biomass in in uh, South Asia in particular. Yeah, we have a question from Jessica. Um, Jessica, would you like to unmute yourself once you're able to and ask your question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, so I was really curious on that, um, you know, continuing on this perspective of 100 gigajoules per person. For the countries that really are using excessive amounts relative to that, you know, what are the, what are the main levers that we can use to reduce people from, you know, 500 gigajoules per person down to 100? And, you know, are these things really feasible or is this kind of just uh, a hypothetical? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there are huge efficiency improvements you can do. I mean, just looking at cars, right? If you are driving a car that gets 25 miles a gallon, there's a perfectly decent car today that gets double, double the, double the mileage. Um, you know, if you look at places like the U.S., which are very, very large energy users, the huge difference between, for example, U.S. and Europe is, um, is uh, in transportation. Uh, there's also a tremendous amount that can be done in terms of building energy efficiency. Um, so th there, there are lots of, lots of low-hanging fruit, you know, and then there are some more expensive things that need to be done, more structural um, you know, vehicle electrification being one example where you can get 
significant efficiency improvements as well. But um, once you do that at scale, it will require fairly massive infrastructure changes to make sure that the electricity system uh, and charging infrastructure is up to the task.